Thank you for the uh, introduction. Thank you to the uh, organizers for the invitation to speak today. And I will actually thank the uh, chair also for uh, setting precedent for being really overtly physics-y, because this is a physics talk. So uh, I'm going to lean into that a bit, if you'll indulge me. I'm uh, speaking today on behalf of a rather large collaboration uh, with uh, the folks at Google Quantum AI, uh, I guess down the street, actually, uh, here. Uh, uh, as well as collaborators at Macquarie University, uh, Quantum Simulations Technologies, and uh, Harvard. Uh, I, myself, along with my co-author Alina, are, uh, am coming from uh, Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, where we've been working uh, together uh, with the folks at Google to develop resource estimates for a particular problem that we really care about. Uh, so this kind of fits in with some of the uh, discussions yesterday in the panel in which uh, dynamic simulation was motivated as being an important uh, problem for uh, quantum computers to tackle. Uh, I, however, will be showing some pretty uh, uh, significant uh, resource requirements for the particular uh, application that I'm looking at today. But uh, ultimately, they seem to be the sort of thing that's encouraging of uh, progress towards uh, essentially using quantum computers to uh, help facilitate the design of uh, inertial fusion uh, targets uh, for energy production. So, uh, setting the stage here, uh, being that this is a particularly uh, physics-y talk, uh, I wanted to kind of, uh, I, I, I almost want to call this an FAQ in some sense, uh, but I've only uh, given this talk once, so uh, F is a bit of a misnomer. But I'd like to at least set the stage by uh, kind of motivating some of the things I'm going to be talking about ahead of time. So stopping power is in the title of my talk, which is to say that we're looking at an algorithm for estimating stopping powers. What is a stopping power, if you've never heard of this before? A stopping power is actually the average kinetic energy lost by a particle moving through a medium, right? And I'll show you some specific examples of this, but you might imagine that this is somehow involved in inertial fusion, based again on the uh, title of the talk. So what does it have to do with inertial fusion? Well, it actually appears in the source term in the energy balance that defines thermonuclear ignition, which is to say that the defining criterion, loss in criterion, for whether uh, thermonuclear ignition has occurred or not uh, is essentially whether alpha particle production is redepositing uh, energy into a burning plasma at a rate that balances against conductive and radiative losses. So that's how we define ignition. So this is a pretty important thing when you're talking about designing uh, ICF targets. Uh, how is it that we compute stopping powers uh, presently? You know, there's a computational uh, talk. I'm going to be telling you about algorithms, quantum algorithms, for calculating uh, stopping powers. What is it that we actually presently do? Well, it turns out we, the, uh, there are many methods that are out there, but kind of the state of the art, the gold standard, as it were, is actually real-time, time-dependent density functional theory. It's a mean field theory, so it's relatively efficient, uh, which allows us to go to relatively large supercell sizes and things like this. Uh, but it's also relatively inaccurate. Uh, I'll show you later, though, that that's a good feature when it comes to uh, prospects for achieving a quantum advantage of some sort, which is to say that the type of quantum advantage that we should expect, suspect, eh, expect in calculating uh, stopping powers uh, on quantum computers is that you're going to essentially arrive at a way uh, to systematically improve your accuracy in representing quantum dynamics. And as uh, Lex was referring to earlier, you don't actually have to be all that accurate. So the particular uh, accuracy bar that we're going to be aiming at today is, is relatively high. Uh, but still, the, the costs are relatively large. But in any event, the aim here is to achieve systematically improvable accuracy at polynomial costs, or you know, polynomial in the number of qubits or whatever. Right? As for you know, what I'm actually going to tell you about, this quantum algorithmic protocol that I'm going to tell you about today is uh, like any quantum simulation algorithm in some sense. We start by preparing a particle in a state with a well-defined velocity. We allow it to evolve in time through some medium in which it's stopping. And then we measure the rate at which it loses kinetic energy. It's relatively straightforward. We're just simulating this on a computer, a quantum computer, as it were. So this is the stage. Uh, all the physics-y jargony stuff you're going to see again and again and again throughout the talk is now uh, established. And uh, yeah, I feel comfortable going on. So since Please. this is about FAQ, do you believe quantum computer will be even cheaper than TDDFT? What do you mean by even uh, cheaper? Yeah, so running full quantum dynamics, so it's definitely new AI. I mean, the whole thing would be the cost would be even cheaper than running TDDFT on the hospital computer. Ah, so the asymptotics are better, uh, which at least is something that uh, I'll allude now to in the result. Do you still think so? Ah, well, I guess that depends on uh, how large of a quantum computer you have and how much you're willing to spend on the classical computer and, you know, kind of like finite instances and things like this. 
So at the very end of this, I guess I'll spoil it. I'll show you Toffoli counts on the large end that are you know 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17. But if you think about the large end of the uh, classical floating point operations I'm going to talk about, these are large calculations. The TDDFT calculations consist of 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22 floating point operations. So even from an operational perspective, um, there's there's a gain there. But yeah, and that's for a relatively large instance, the sort of instance that you know we fit onto the large. Uh, machines that the DOE gives us. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Certainly. All right. Any others? Yeah. Please. Uh, what is stopping power? <laughs> All right. Yeah. The, the the histogram with the frequencies is is incremented. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, this will be an FAQ yet. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, incidentally, uh, thank you for that transition, right? Uh, here's a, a slightly more cartoonish definition of stopping power that, that gives you a less abstract notion of what it is that I'm talking about. So we typically start with some target when we're talking about stopping power, and typically that target has its density and chemical composition fixed, uh, and it's going to start in some equilibrium state, which is to say that we're going to consider in a situation in which it doesn't have some charged particle impinging upon it, right? The target in the case of the ICF stuff that we're going to talk about is deuterium or high density carbon. Uh, but you know, you could insert your favorite material in here and do your own resource estimates if you wanted to. The projectile is the other ingredient in the stopping power. Uh, the bare charge and mass of that particle are fixed. And its initial energy, uh, kinetic energy in particular, is prescribed, right? So you're going to aim a beam of particles at the target. In this case, this is like a little ball or whatever that we're throwing at the target. And it's going to bounce around inside of the target and come out the other side in a situation in which it has less kinetic energy than it had when it went in. The energy is lost in collisions with the nuclei in the target, the electrons in the target, and if you go fast enough, light, which is to say Brem Schallung can uh, contribute to this, but we're not going to talk about the day. Today we're only concerned with electronic collisions because both nuclear and kind of radiative stopping uh, contributions are relatively straightforward, actually. The electronic ones are the things that are expensive. Please. Initial energy is relativistic or non-relativistic? They can be relativistic. So uh, tens of kiloelectron volts uh, often occurs on the low end of things, but you can imagine going all the way up to megaev or gigaev. So uh, yeah, we're not going to be considering relativity today, though. So please. Is that bare truck? Like, is that as opposed to like with shielding from like air production stuff? Or is that? Um, that's probably a bit more elaborate than what I uh, intend to apply, though that is, uh, I guess, part of it in some sense. Uh, what I mean is actually that if you get into the stopping literature, uh, people talk about the effective charge state of the particle as it's traversing the medium, which is to say that it will pick up electrons. You know, if you have some very highly charged ion or something like this, you know, electrons from the target medium will fall into it. Yeah, please. Positively charged or negatively charged? Uh, for the examples I'll consider today, positively charged, negatively charged is a okay as well, though. So, well defined thing. Cool. All right. So uh, again, we're only going to consider electronic uh, collisions today and the contributions that those make. And here, stopping power, just to give you an equation or something like this, uh, though it's not a terribly meaningful one, is the differential energy loss per unit length. Right? And this is also energy dependent, which is to say that uh, as a function of the instant kinetic energy, this thing is going to vary. Right? So this is your stopping power. It's just this energy loss per unit length. Right? And I'll note this has units of force, not power. Uh, blame someone else, uh, not me. So how do we actually uh, calculate these things from first principles? I mentioned this gold standard method of time dependent density functional theory. And I'll actually show you some equations uh, for TDDFT later. But what we're ultimately going to do is simulate the dynamics of a projectile on a nanometer length scale, so a very small, differentially small in some sense, uh, brick of material over at a second time scale. So electronic dynamics are occurring, but most of the nuclei are fixed actually. It turns out that this problem is actually governed by the same Hamiltonian that uh, we've seen time and time again in chemistry and material science, which is to say that this uh, Born-Oppenheimer uh, approximation to the uh, electronic structure Hamiltonian, uh, kinetic energy, electron ion uh, potential energy, and electron-electron repulsive uh, potential energy. This is this is how we're modeling this. It's the same thing as usual. This is the electronic structure problem. A minus is missing. Ah, thank you. Yes, uh, I'll fix that later. So, 
There's also a kinetic energy and an attractive term for the projectile as well. Uh, we'll get into some of that a bit later. Uh, but ultimately, what we're doing is um, just simulating the dynamics of uh, something like this. This is a little movie right here. Oh, goodness. Uh, you have essentially a proton here passing through deuterium plasma. I hit go, and it Pac-Mans around the box, excites things. You know, these are essentially the charged excitations of the system. So essentially what you're observing here are the excitations of the charged particle in the medium as it traverses through, and that's what's causing the electronic stopping, right? And that's what we simulate. Please. So do you also calculate the dynamics of the medium, so to say? Yeah, effectively. OK. But the nuclei are fixed, but the electrons can you also want want to see what the, what the medium does, so to say, or the electrons. Yeah. At the, the velocities that we care about, the ions will move very little, uh, other than the projectile ion. So the projectile ion will be moving at a velocity that's, in the cases that we care about, about commensurate with the electronic velocity. So that one nucleus is kind of going non yeah, yeah. higher, yeah. but yeah. What is the electron density? Is it the electron gas approximation now working or not? This is a full uh, first principles model. We're not doing jelly or anything like this, but the densities that we care about tend to be uh, you know, atomic units on the order of one, uh, you know, there's solid density. Uh, please. If you make measurements at the end, this will only be done on the surface, or do you really look inside, or? Uh, so when people actually measure this in an experiment, it's an integrated energy loss. So you try to make some thin film or something like that and fire a projectile through and then measure the energy loss, in which case you're not getting the differential, but you're getting kind of, yeah, an integral of it. Yeah. Please. On a big energy loss or a small energy loss from in, like, an experiment? Uh, in an experiment, or? Yeah, like if you know, you're know you trying to design these for fusion, do you want the target to absorb a lot of energy, no energy? Uh, you, you want it to absorb a lot of energy, um, but you, you kind of get what, what nature gives you in some sense. So, yeah. Um, Warm is relative to plasma physicists who have a very strange notion of what warm means. So this essentially means the temperature is on the order of the Fermi energy. And Fermi energies of metals are, of course, uh, tens of electron volts. So we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of Kelvin. But this means, <laughs> but this means electrons have been stripped off? No. Uh, we're actually at densities and temperatures that uh, you see things like partial ionization so on and so forth. So that's, that's kind of the distinguishing feature in some sense of this warm dense regime is that it's dense enough to still be strongly coupled and it's warm enough as to not be completely ionized and, you know, yeah. All's good? Cool. So who cares about this? Um, hopefully you do at this point. Uh, but I'll try to give you some more reasons. Uh, some applications include radiation damage in space, satellites and things like this, nuclear reactors, Charged particle microscopies, transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, helium ion beam microscopy, cancer therapies, people care about using ion beams and things like this in order to uh, you know, treat cancer. So here's an example from the literature of some people doing some time-dependent density functional theory calculations of uh, protons uh, interacting with DNA, actually, in solvated uh, systems. So you can see these are relatively large calculations just from how grainy that picture is, right? Nuclear spin qubits in silicon are another fun one to bring up just because we're at a quantum computing conference. People use stopping power tables to design ion implantation schedules for placing nuclear spins inside of silicon in which they hope to make uh, quantum computers somehow. So it's kind of a fun application relevant to this. But you know, at the end of the day, the things that I've told you about so far are all relatively straightforward as far as measurement is concerned. You know, we like to think about you know, quantum computers as conferring some sort of advantage and we often ignore the problem of how easy it is for someone to go into a laboratory, let's say, and actually just measure the darn thing that we want to simulate. If you want to measure a stopping power, you need a source of charged particles to fire at your target, a few samples of the target in case you're going to really mess it up when you hit it with your, your particle beam, and a spectrometer to measure essentially this energy loss. Right. So. That's all well and good, and in terrestrial conditions, there are a ton of experimental databases available that allow you to look up what stopping powers in particular materials are and so on and so forth. There's still value, of course, in computation, but I'd like to think that some of the added value of the prospect of a quantum computer in this space is the uh, essentially cost of doing experiments in these uh, fusion uh, scenarios that I'm going to be telling you about, which is to say that 
because creating uh, samples of the target uh, that, that live for a long time require the investment of fabulously rare resources, large experimental facilities designed to do fusion implosions and things like this. There's a lot of, I guess, added value in some sense to a computational capability that can shine light in some sense on these conditions that otherwise don't occur in a laboratory. So let me tell you a bit more about why uh, this matters for fusion. So inertial confinement fusion, I've stolen a figure here from this Nature article by Alex Alistair et al. that uh, describes one of the triumphs recently at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in which uh, essentially a burning plasma was achieved. Or I think the title of this is like burning plasma achieves ignition or something like this. But at the end of the day, this figure describes an ICF experiment of the sort that's done at the NIF, right? in which you have a large number of lasers that are impinging upon essentially the holes in a tiny high Z metallic capsule called a hull round. And those lasers are essentially heating up the walls of that hull round in such a way that they're going to then uh, essentially emit x-rays, right? Those x-rays and the radiation pressure thereof are then going to compress a tiny little capsule full of deuterium and tritium fuel in such a way as to um, you know, basically combine the DTs together in such a way that you produce alpha particles and you achieve this sort of burning uh, fusion reaction, right? Uh, I guess D was talking about pots previously. Now we have a pressure cooker of some sort. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'll be, a, you know, yeah. So we're concerned essentially with the prospect of, uh, in this target, essentially, what's happening is this thing is compressing and you know, this, this fusion process is, is, is occurring. Well, it turns out that this self-heating process that I've described in which alpha particles are generated at a certain temperature and those then redeposit their kinetic energy into the burning plasma and that sustains the burn, that's ultimately what is defining ignition against the losses due to you know, conduction and radiation and so forth. So this is all to kind of convince you that this is kind of an important uh, problem. So, you might wonder what material science has to do with this or electronic structure theory. And ultimately, this is to say that there are many problems in fusion, not just the stopping power problem, but generically many problems in fusion that wind up being problems of materials in extreme conditions, right? This is a photo of the Z uh, plus power facility at Sandia, where I work. And this is to give you a sense of just uh, how extreme the conditions are. I don't know if you can imagine the room being like this suddenly. I don't think any of us would want to be in here. Uh, so this is to say that we use these giant pulse power uh, facilities in order to generate the conditions that are similar to those in ICF implosions. And in point of fact, I've taken a figure from a 2014 PRL from some of my colleagues in the Z facility uh, in which they're evaluating one of their own uh, fusion concepts called magnetized liner inertial fusion. And there are beautiful radiographs in this that will actually show you essentially what these, these ICF implosions look like in experiments, but I chose to show you a simulation of this for one simple reason. And that's because ultimately the hydrodynamic simulations that are actually being used to design these things require us to go into each little brick in the PDE solver and define all the different materials properties, equations of state, stopping powers, uh, electrical conductivities, opacities, all this sort of stuff, right? So we have to have these fabulously wide-ranging tables that go into parameterizing these models. And there's actually a fair bit of demand for computing those properties uh, from first principles so we can check those models effectively. It's also to say that the instabilities that you see in this sort of simulated implosion are part of what makes fusion hard. It's not a nuclear physics problem per se, but more of a material science problem in the sense that the losses that are going to essentially you know, reduce the amount of energy that you're getting out are essentially due to this sort of turbidity and the fact that you're losing energy to the development of hydrodynamic instabilities. So getting the materials properties, pretty important if you want to understand what's happening in your experiment. This is all compounded by the fact that we can't easily create these conditions in the laboratory other than at very fabulously rare facilities like the Z uh, facility or the National Ignition Facility. So, I'm going to tell you about materials in extreme conditions, and I'm not going to tell you per se about ICF capsules and ignition, which happens you know, uh, somewhere around 100 million Kelvin. Uh, so ICF capsules at ignition, you know, that, that's its own thing. What we're concerned with today is this oval in the middle here uh, called warm dense matter. And ultimately, the materials models that we have are really difficult to constrain inside of this uh, particular region. Right? 
And this corresponds to this weird place where you have partial ionization, you don't have something that looks like a classical plasma, you have a degenerate strongly coupled plasma instead. Right? And the unfortunate fact is that the fuel that you are going to ignite, prospectively, has to kind of pass through this, this region. And we don't understand that region quite as well as we would like to. Right? So we need to tabulate the material's properties over this like, wide range of conditions that occur in an experiment, including this weird regime that we don't understand all that well, in order to develop simulations and iterate and design things. You know, these are hundred to thousand person efforts. I mean, this is a non-trivial, large scientific investment. But it turns out that the best models that we have available for, say, properties like stopping power to go into these types of calculations, um, they're pretty expensive. So I have taken an image uh, from my colleague, uh, Lena Kononov, who's preparing a paper on this, uh, hopefully before the end of the year here in which we're looking at first principles calculations of stopping power of aluminum in the warm dense regime. We chose aluminum because aluminum is the canonical, you know, easy free electron metal. So this is a benchmark calculation actually for some of our other colleagues at Sandia. And what you see here are stopping power curves. This is that proton velocity or initial kinetic energy. This is that force, that stopping power. And you see it's got this nice shape. And the different colors correspond to different temperatures between one EV, which is about 11,800-ish uh, Kelvin, and 10 and 20 EV, which are 10 and 20 times that, right? Which is to say that this entire figure right here is, you know, just a bunch of TDDFT calculations carried out at finite temperature. It turns out, though, that this plot took about 250, C 250 million CPU hours and 18 months to generate. This was on a $170 million machine. Uh, it's probably about 10% of the cycles for about a year and a half. So you can do your value estimate for that, right? So, you know, there's, there's a clear uh, cost involved in these types of simulations. And it's worth noting that we're not just running these calculations willy-nilly. It's not like we're filling out these tables using these really expensive models for hydrodynamic modeling. That's not the case whatsoever. We're actually using these to check very efficient models that are used in hydrodynamic modeling, which is to say that we want the data to be as of high quality as we can possibly have it be, right? Unfortunately, it's really hard to assess the accuracy of these models because we're essentially using mean field theories that aren't really systematically improvable in some sense. So I've chosen some data here from another paper uh, that was actually just in this morning uh, accepted in Nature, or what's it, MPJ Computational Materials, in which we're essentially looking at the example of aluminum in cold, dense conditions, so just aluminum sitting on the shelf. And what you see in this plot on the left right here is one of these stopping curves and some data from us and some data from our collaborators at the uh, UIUC, as well as an experimental stopping power table in the dashed lines right here. And what you see is that actually we get a pretty decent agreement uh, between theory and experiment uh, for a lot of the points at which we did these calculations, right? Which is great. Uh, however, this is also the set of experiments like these are things that we can do experiments on. If we change the temperature, we no longer know how well we're doing, right? Another thing that's worth remarking on in terms of time-dependent density functional theory, the theory that we're using here, is that we don't even necessarily have a systematic understanding of the approximations that are going into this. So on the right-hand side here, I have some arbitrarily labeled finite size error here as a function of the proton velocity. And I'm comparing essentially finite size errors evaluated using TDDFT and a plasmon-based model for the finite size errors that people thought was pretty reliable, uh, I guess, until this gets published, right? Which is to say that we think that we have a systematic understanding of a lot of these errors. We don't actually in practice. And this calls into question, you know, how generally reliable these sorts of calculations can be, right? Well, yeah. Finite size errors? Yeah. Why do you call it finite? Oh, why do we call it finite size error? Because uh, it's essentially the thing that we're trying to assess is how the stopping power changes as you make the box larger and larger. So people will typically say, using a dielectric function model, that you're essentially imposing an infrared cutoff on some integral in k-space. And that's essentially what this is, is cutting off that integral. So, so what is this picture supposed to be saying? Like the higher the velocity, the larger the finite size error or something? That's part of it, yeah. Part of what you should be taking away from that is that higher velocities lead to larger finite size errors, and that's actually relatively intuitive. Uh, 
I mean, it is coming back. That's actually part of it. Is there's kind of like an Ouroboros effect, as we call it. You know, the the proton is eating its own tail. But um, the bigger thing to take away from this is that this is quite a bit larger than this, which is what people assign as being the actual finite size error, in spite of the fact that it's not. And the unit of it? It's a relative error. Ah, yeah. Well, this is like thirty percent. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, do I take away from this that your plasma cutoff model is bad, or the T to DFT calculation is not good enough? Probably a little both. Okay. Um, the plasma cutoff model, this is a slightly better than average plasma cutoff model. This is a plasma cutoff model that actually incorporates uh, like non gelium uh, sort of effects into it. But yeah. Uh, have you used both uh, forward and inverse modeling to basically compare uh, your modeling uh, or your models against the data? Um, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, in forward modeling, basically what you do, you cut the model to the prediction and you compare against the data. And in the inverse modeling, what you do is this mini optimization procedure where you find the parameters that might fit better your experimental data. So I just wonder if maybe that would help with you. Ah. Uh, we could in some sense, though in this case, because this is like a first principles calculation for a solid, there aren't that many uncertainties, let's say. Uh, like the inverse model, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot that we could wiggle around, let's say, to maybe better match the data, if that makes sense. Thanks. Please. Just a quick question. So you said like it takes like a machine that, to, that is like $170 million to simulate these things, right? How much do the actual experiments like cost to make? Because you say you don't have experimental data. So. Ah, that's a good <laughs> question. So for what it's worth, there are between three and four data sets on stopping power in the swarm dense regime that exist right now over the past 10 years. And in order to get those data sets, you get like one or two shots at a time. So they're fabulously small data sets. And, you know, they're literally like, you know, three or four shots on one of these large facilities. So um, I don't know the like aggregate cost, let's say, which is to say that I can tell you more about like the human time associated with trying to get access to these things or whatever. But, you know, the facilities that can implement these things are hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, too. So like, they also, you know, to run these large facilities costs at least an order of magnitude more money, I think, than, you know, just having a supercomputer sitting there uh, making the room hot. So. Cool. All right. So let's go back to first principles, uh, stopping power calculations, and how it is that we do them. So I've taken a differently colored uh, shot of something like that movie that I showed earlier. What I want to show you is how we actually do the calculations to get that stopping power number out, which is to say that we run this particle through at Pac-Man's around. And as a function of displacement, we're able to compute, say, the work that either the proton is doing on the system if we hold it at a fixed velocity, or the work that the system is doing on the proton if the uh, proton is allowed to stop. We do both types of calculations, actually. From that, we can use a moving average to fit a slope, essentially. We're really just getting a slope of this line, effectively, and one that more or less ignores these sharp bumps, or you know, accommodates them in the sense that they're included in the average, but yeah. So that's essentially it. We just drag this around. We compute the work done or the force. Uh, both are comparably easy on the classical computer, and we can fit a line or just, again, compute the average force. Right? So that's how we do the calculation. This is based on a representative supercell. Again, you know, an order nanometer chunk of the material with tens to, hundred, tens to thousands of atoms or electrons. And yeah, it's at some fixed velocity, pretty straightforward. You know, this, this, is, this is as good as it gets. So we're essentially doing the same sort of thing on a classical computer. We're just simulating dynamics. You know, it's like pretty straightforward. So how do we simulate dynamics? This is where I start to show you some more equations. Time dependent density functional theory is the primary theory we use. The time dependent cone Schamm equations govern the electron dynamics. They take this particular mean field form right here. And the density inside of this total potential here is thermally weighted. And that's how we actually account for uh, temperature. And this particular theory is using the Merman formalism of uh, time dependent density functional theory, really density functional theory. And this density-dependent one-body potential consists of three terms. The external potential, which say includes the Coulomb field of all the ions. The Hartree potential was just the classical electrostatic uh, potential of the electron density. And the exchange correlation potential, which is the central approximation in time-dependent density functional theory and density functional theory in general. The problem is, is that there's no systematic way to develop approximations for this. And in TDDFT, the problem is actually far worse, which is to say that the exact potential we know actually to have many features like discontinuities and jumps and all sorts of weird things like this that are actually extremely difficult to approximate. 
your history dependence, all this sort of stuff that make this actually a slightly more challenging problem in some respects, right? So we like that we can do these calculations, and we like that TDDFT gives us pretty good results, but if we had a quantum computer dropped in our lap that could do these same things exactly tomorrow, we would certainly use that instead. That gets us to the prospect of uh, essentially uh, doing quantum dynamics uh, relative to uh, mean field theories, and this gets back to uh, Lynn's question earlier, which is to say that TDDFT has the form of a mean field theory. So does something like time-dependent Hartree-Fock. In fact, that's more overtly a mean field theory. In either case, we're simply propagating the dynamics of a single Slater determinant right, in time. Time-dependent Hartree-Fock is fundamentally limited in its accuracy by merit of the fact that it is a single Slater determinant, and it's ignoring all electronic correlation in some sense. Time-dependent density functional theory is practically limited in its accuracy. There are theorems that say that you can do this and it will work out, but you need some magical formula that will tell you what the actual exact answer is anyhow. In general, though, the thing to take away from about either of these things is that things that take this mean field theory form are generally the least expensive and least accurate classical algorithms that we have access to. And this is where I'm going to point to a paper from 2023 uh, written by Ryan Babish et al., uh, including uh, some folks at uh, Columbia and I guess myself too, um, in which the costs of exact quantum algorithms for dynamics are compared to the costs of uh, mean field uh, classical algorithms, again, for electronic dynamics. And there's a giant table right here, and the thing that you should ultimately take away is that if you look at the gate complexities attendant to the classical bits, you'll notice that some of the exponents are actually conspicuously larger than some of the exponents for the exact quantum dynamics, which is to say this is nice motivation for saying that, okay, these asymptotic costs, you can contrive of essentially scenarios in which the asymptotic costs for doing these things on a quantum computer exactly are actually lower than the costs of doing uh, the problem approximately on a classical computer, which is kind of a profound result in the sense that it's basically telling you there's potentially some sort of polynomial advantage over the worst classical algorithm in some sense. And worst here is kind of a good faith notion of worst. You know, this is the worst thing that someone would try in some sense. So that's pretty cool. Um, any questions? I, I guess I'm going to call Lynn out just in case this is a, an opportune time to, to talk about this. If there's any, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I know that uh, uh, classical, I mean, because of the saving really comes from uh, when you have a very, very large number of basic functions, there is uh, some saving from the quantum side, right? This is help, yeah. Yeah, so the, I guess the counter argument from the classical community is they're going to justify their best uh, quantized tensor train mm -hmm. uh, type of things and also reduce the cost, and uh, then I think the game will be better. Yeah, I think that's fair, yeah. At least in the case of these stopping power calculations, the bases tend to be quite large uh, because they're relatively disordered. It's not like you have molecular orbitals, things like this that you can contrive with that are all that nice. But um, yeah, I, I agree, I mean, the sentiment, so. Yeah. Okay, so it's a cool paper. Uh, go out and read it, I suppose. Uh, yeah. So this motivates us to start looking for uh, essentially quantum algorithms for implementing dynamics uh, in pursuit of an advantage over classical mean field theories, like the TDDFT calculations that we're pursuing for stopping power. So what are the challenges for developing a quantum algorithmic protocol for estimating stopping power? Well, the naive approach is just to essentially copy uh, literally everything that we would do in time-dependent DFT, but using our qu favorite quantum dynamics algorithm instead, right? which is to say that, you know, I've mentioned before that we compute, say, the work as a function of displacement, this blue line. Well, that requires us to estimate the total energy for multiple evolution times. That's maybe not a great idea because energy estimation is expensive. In this case, of course, the Hamiltonian, of course, is going to scale with the size of the system, right? So looking at kind of a global quantity like that is probably a bit uh, wasteful in some sense. We might also consider estimating the force on the projectile at multiple evolution times. So essentially this thing, once we're getting this uh, effectively slope right here, just sampling the force directly. Well, it turns out that the force operator, because it's ultimately going to be a gradient of something like a one over R, actually has a large norm and a relatively large variance. And I'll say even for stochastic classical methods like quantum Monte Carlo, this variance problem is one of the banes of their existence. The fact that it's difficult to compute forces in, say, real space Monte Carlo methods due to the large variance attendant to the fact that the Coulomb potential uh, has a 1 over R squared when you take the gradient, right? The, the force, right? 
So that's great. Another thing is that in the classical uh, algorithm, the projectile is itself a classical point particle. It has a well-defined position, and we're just moving it along you know, some wire. right? It turns out that that would, if we were to copy it identically uh, from, say, TDDFT into the context of this uh, stopping power uh, protocol, this would require us to implement a time-dependent Hamiltonian simulation algorithm instead of a time-independent Hamiltonian simulation algorithm. It turns out that we can kill all of these birds with one stone by simply making the projectile itself an explicit quantum degree of freedom, which is to say that now the autonomous dynamics of the Hamiltonian, including the projectile, not as you know, some parameterized thing with a particular position, but you know, as itself a particle that's dynamics are evolving under a time-independent Hamiltonian, we get rid of the fact that we you know, needed to do time-dependent simulation. And we can also now estimate directly the kinetic energy at multiple evolution times. The kinetic energy is going to be more well-behaved and against a more local quantity, right? So this is the crux of the protocol that I'm about to tell you about, is to insert the projectile as an explicit quantum degree of freedom and estimate its kinetic energy under this dynamical evolution. Um, please. Uh, again, to this problem, we have to estimate the total energy for multiple evolution times. Why do we have to do this? Because I would say we just need to estimate the total energy after the projectiles gone through our medium. So can't I just take some long time and then say, what's the energy of my, of my system? Ah, so notice this particular uh, thing right here. Right? This is the work as a function of time. See that it's jumpy, right? If I choose any arbitrary time, um, I'm not necessarily going to get the right regressed slope, right? So you only need maybe five to 10 points in practice at which you would need to compute the total energy in order to get a decent estimate of that slope. But, right? I, but that's ultimately the problem. They should add up. Uh, and, or is the, is the particle regaining energy from the medium again? Or? What if I chose to compute the energy right there? The slope would then be overestimated. right? You want to have some decent sampling of this to get away from the fact that this isn't actually a perfectly linear function. It's maybe the best way to put it. Yeah. Cool. We're good? All right. So as a quick summary of the protocol that I'm about to tell you about, and again, the culmination of this is going to be a bunch of Toffoli counts. So there's going to be a very high level and somewhat heuristic description of the quantum algorithm. We have essentially uh, five steps starting with the zero step, which is that we start by choosing representation for the system, again, the target plus the projectile. We then prepare the initial state for the electron projectile dynamics. We need to know what the electrons are doing initially and what the projectile is doing initially. We then time evolve using whatever approach is the cheapest. We measure the projectile's kinetic energy loss along its trajectory. And then we process the sampled outcomes to estimate uh, the stopping power in some way. And I'll show you examples of all of these things. So as far as representing the system is concerned, we're working in first quantization. Uh, the first paper kind of articulating the, the details of the particular basis that we're using is this paper by Ryan Babish et al. and MPJ Quantum Info in 2019. The block encodings are articulated in exquisite detail in this PRX Quantum uh, paper in 2021 by Yuan Tzu et al. Uh, and these are essentially the starting points for our analysis, right? Which is to say that at a high level, the way that we're representing the system is this first quantization approach in which each electron is going to consist of a register of essentially bit strings that encode integers that describe uh, wave numbers associated with momentum eigenstates, uh, basically plane wave basis functions, right? So we have some KP here. This is that wave number, and this P is that integer, right? Attendant to you know, any particular uh, momentum eigenstate in this particular grid. Right? So this P is in this set right here, where N is the cardinality, the number of the basis functions that we ultimately have the number of plane waves in our calculation. Right? So each particle is going to have a register that is going to essentially have a bunch of these integers encoded in bit strings in it. Right? And the whole thing's going to be anti-symmetrized to be fermionic, but that's the basic idea. The electrons are all treated as quantum mechanical, and only the projectile nucleus is treated as quantum mechanical. And it's worth noting, actually, that we use distinct grids between the electrons and the nuclei which is to say that there would be a different set of these for the nucleus, which is going to have higher momenta components in it. Right? And the qubit overhead associated with this is linear in the uh, number of electrons, 3 eta log you know, the number of plane waves here, plus 3 times log the number of plane waves in the basis for the projectile. 
And according to numerics that are in the paper, you can essentially reduce this to the cost of adding a single particle plus nine more uh, qubits, essentially, in practice. Right? So it's not a huge overhead associated with doing this. So these non-projectile nuclei, the background things, they're not going to move. We don't have to worry about encoding them in first quantization or anything like this. It's just the projectile nucleus. And it's worth also noting that there are several non-trivial extensions of the block encodings in this uh, Sue et al. paper in our archive posting. And this essentially accounts for the details of incorporating the projectile itself into the typical electronic structure Hamiltonian for this particular problem. So interesting details if you're into that sort of stuff. Uh, but probably best left for a read the paper. Yeah. State preparation. We've heard a fair bit about thermal state preparation uh, throughout this conference. And this is a relatively heuristic approach, right? which is to say that the initial state that we want to prepare, we're going to sample over, say, many pure state trajectories. And ultimately, the joint electron projectile system is going to be initialized as such in a product state of something that looks like the Gibbs state and something that looks like or is actually a Gaussian wave packet in a momentum space that is sharply peaked at the projectile of the velocity. Right? So this is essentially trying to approximate that point particle moving at the velocity at which we want to measure the stopping power. I'll go through the state preparation details, again, somewhat heuristically uh, for both of these now. So for the electronic subsystem, this is, of course, generically uh, difficult to uh, prepare or sample from. So we're actually just sampling over many mean field initial states that we're drawing from merman koncham density functional theory. So the initial electronic state is drawn from a canonical ensemble that's associated with some mean field initial state from the Hohenberg cone, uh, not Hohenberg cone, but the merman koncham uh, DFT calculation that we would use to say generate the initial state of the electrons anyhow. So these probabilities are easy to compute, actually. It's relatively trivial. This, of course, relies for us to be able to you know, take a set of orbitals, though, and prepare uh, Slater determinants. And there are advances attendant to that that are used in this, uh, in this uh, mean field paper uh, by uh, Babishal in 2023. So we're essentially just going to be sampling initial states according to canonical distribution on the mean field reference. That's not um, Extension thereof, yeah. Um, It's a slight modification to the prior given stuff. I, 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 yeah. I can, we can do it offline maybe. Is that okay? Cool. Um, so the projectile state, we have this Gaussian wave packet in momentum space sharply peaked. Uh, the standard deviation of this wave packet is a free parameter. Uh, so we might start by looking at essentially the variance or standard deviation attendant to localizing a proton on its actual physical radius. That's a terrible idea, it turns out, because a proton is about a functometer, right, in size. So in atomic units, essentially, the standard deviation of this thing in momentum space is going to be like 10 to the 4 or something crazy like this. Right? What is Slater determinants? Is there a definition for this determinant? A Slater determinant is a way of generating an anti-symmetrized form of a fermionic wave function based on essentially taking a matrix and populating it with uh, single particle orbitals, right, and then taking a determinant in which essentially each row or column, however you want to think about it, is, um, you know, permuted, essentially. So it's to basically generate the determinant structure allows you to have something that looks like, uh, you know, an anti-symmetric an anti linear combination of all these different terms. Yeah. Please. Five. Ah, okay, cool. Thanks. All right. So. We don't need this to be the actual physical size of a proton. There's some numerics that we ultimately did in order to convince ourselves that we can make the uh, variance or standard deviation on this, rather, sorry, uh, 10 to 4 times uh, better in some sense. So we can actually look at standard deviations that are you know, 4 to 10 atomic units or so is what you'll be seeing for the rest of the talk right here. So this is all to say that the reason for this is because uh, the electrons uh, kind of uh, see as much of the Coulomb potential as they need to. Uh, you can, you know, it's going to look like an error function or whatever on some length scale determined by the standard deviation, the Coulomb potential, and the extent to which, uh, you know, it really needs to see the details of that, you know, allows you to be very sloppy in some sense in how you represent this. This uses a particular algorithm for preparing a Gaussian state uh, cited here, and this is a relatively small cost to the overall uh, Toffoli Council I'll show you. 
Time evolution in the system. So we consider time evolution using a bunch of different approaches, cubitization, interaction, picture, cauterization. Uh, kind of the usual things follow, which is say cubitization is easy to understand and bound, but maybe suboptimal in some senses, and that it requires the you know, LCU norms or whatever, the, the full Hamiltonian to be carried around. Interaction picture pretty early on using the results from the Sue et al. block encoding paper, we were able to determine this is not going to be competitive here, actually. And trotterization, of course, is just hard to bound. So I'll give you a high level overview. We essentially look at cubitization toffoli counts and trot trotterization toffoli counts. In cubitization, we're implementing dynamics using kind of the standard approach, which is, say, uh, using quantum signal processing to implement the Jacobi Anger uh, expansion for either the IHT. Uh, I know, again, that the block encoding here needs to include the projectile. Uh, so this is somewhat straightforward in some sense. Uh, trotterization, there is a little bit of art here, which is to say that the trotter estimates are actually based for a real space grid representation with a comparable resolution to our plane wave calculation. And this trotterization count is based on some nice work uh, essentially combining this uh, QROM interpolation idea and uh, essentially uh, aimed at facilitating newton rafeson iteration in order to compute the inverse square root and the Coulomb uh, potential, right? So there are nice details of that in the paper. And for actually getting, say, constants for trotterization, uh, significant numerical testing by uh, you know, the lead author, Nick Rubin, uh, went into uh, that, which is to say that we use some of the tighter trotter error bounds that were part of actually this paper that Yuan Su had uh, talked about earlier in the week. And some of the you know, heroic numerics that uh, Nick did essentially allowed us to constrain uh, somewhat some of the constants associated with that particular trotter error bound. So the numbers that you'll see are associated with that. And uh, yeah, of course, the usual caveat of trotter numerics uh, applies here. So we're just going to time evolve according to one of these. And I'll show you results for both trotter and cubitization. So, so the flavor of the bounding, the high bound of the quad error would be similar to your question talked about? I think it's different, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to embarrass myself and say that I didn't actually see Christian's talk. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was looking forward to watching it later on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're able to uh, profile our protocol. Uh, using some of the tools that uh, Tanish uh, talked about uh, yesterday uh, during the panel discussion, uh, which is to say that the Google folks used this nice CircFT tool that I guess has maybe been uh, subsumed by this Qualtran tool in order to build and model uh, the entire protocol. And this is essentially the uh, decomposed cost of the block encoding of this uh, electron projectile Hamiltonian for a couple of different real instances, right? And what you see here is that the dominant Toffoli cost here for all these different subroutines attendant to this block encoding is this C4. What is C4? Well, it turns out that C4 is a part of the select that just involves a bunch of controlled swaps. For better and for worse, this is probably about as good as it gets, but it allows you to see kind of straightforwardly that you know, this is what's driving the cost right here. This is essentially a term that's going to scale. The Toffoli count scales with eta, the number of electrons. So it's a little bit gnarly. So yeah. To get into the details of how we measure the kinetic energy, we compared estimates of the kinetic energy loss just using the standard quantum limit, so just directly measuring, essentially just directly sampling the kinetic energy, to a Heisenberg scaling approach, uh, incidentally uh, part of what Robin talked about earlier in the week. Um, so what you see in this plot right here is as a function of the precision, the Toffoli count for the aggregate protocol uh, with a bunch of different standard deviations for that nuclear wave packet. And it turns out, actually, uh, per my allusion to uh, Lex earlier, the accuracies that we need are actually relatively high. They're on this end of things. So it turns out for the counts that you're going to see here, the SQL algorithm is actually preferable to the Heisenberg scaling one. And it might be the case that you know getting underneath that occurs for some non-fusion application that requires higher accuracy. But yeah, please. So why is here the um, say exponents? Are, why is it so much larger than compared to the previous slide? Like in the previous slide, it was 10 to the power of 4 or so. So what is causing this large, you know, if you go just pick one slide. Ah, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is just the cost of the block encoding, not running the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. And, well, repeating it too, many times. There's a sampling cost too. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we then take those sampled outcomes, those kinetic energy losses, and we're able to reconstruct a stopping power curve. And 
This allows us to assess the sampling requirements. Yeah? Another question, right? That's the plumbing. I mean, you have the, the 17 to 15, and the block encoding cost is 10 to the 5. So there is a 10 to the 10 factor. I mean, even taking into account the, the, yeah, if you look at the block encoding, the number of possibly is 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5. Two slides before. The, before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the total top day is about 10 to the 5, I'd say. Again, this is just one set of wow. subroutines, yeah. So those other factors, yes, and are quite large. This thing by 10 to the 10. You're not repeating it 10 to the 10 times. That's another <laughs> factor is the sampling cost, right? But How much? I think a factor of about 100. So another so two orders of magnitude. The, five. the next slide, the lowest one, is 10 to the 15. So yeah. there's 10 to the 10. Sure. So how could you buy? How do you go through the 10 orders magnitude? So there's also going to be effectively the, the attendant uh, like lambda in this, right? So the lambda is large, the norm, right? Okay. That's about three orders magnitude. No, it's more than that. It's more than that. I mean, the numbers here are, yeah. No, the, the numbers, you, you don't have that. Right? Uh, what I'm saying is that the, the, the cost wrong in the whole thing is 10 to the 15. Yes. One block encoding is 10 to the 5. Yes. There are 10 more of magnitude difference. Can you give the rust breakdown? Yeah, so some of it is due to the sampling. Some of it is effectively yeah. due to the lambda. Yeah. I don't know how many. But. Yeah. That is essentially it. You're also not looking, per se, at the exact same instances between the two. Which is to say that, I forget off the top of my head which instance this is for here, and which instances these are for. We looked at different system sizes as well. But I would have to sit down and look at the numbers to show you a more precise breakdown, and I'd be happy to do so. But yeah, I mean, the, the norm is large, yeah. And they're sampling, yeah. So, yeah, we're able to reproduce this. Um, and these are the actual resource counts here for both uh, product formulas and QSP, right? So these are the end Toffoli counts. And this is kind of what I was alluding to is the fact that uh, in some of the cases, we're looking at things that vary by several orders of magnitude just because the size of the system is varying too, right? So this is the number of electrons and all these things, so that gives you a sense of the size of the system in some sense, and this is the projectile and the host, right? So this is a relatively small instance. These are the qubit counts, and what you can see essentially is that for this smallest instance in some sense, the top of the count is about 100 times the state of the art for something like FOMOCO. For larger instances, the counts are closer to FOMOCO a while ago. And uh, yeah, there's some cause for optimism because this is the first time that anyone's kind of gone through this sort of routine for this sort of application, I would say, right? So um, I'll suggest that strongly non-equilibrium dynamics of even 28 electrons in a large basis set is classically challenging. I'm not saying uh, intractable because this is going to be on YouTube, I guess, but I would be willing to hedge on that. Uh, but yeah, this instance, even though uh, it's quite demanding, would actually tell us something interesting about how mean field approximations fail, nevertheless, right? And again, this is kind of what I was alluding to at the beginning of the talk. For a classical perspective, for these large calculations, 10% of a 45 plot machine running for a week to calculate a number is 10 to the 21 floating point operations, right? And that's the sort of resources that we're throwing at this. So in spite of the fact that these gate counts are quite large, so are the classical costs, right? So I'm going to leave my conclusion slide up because I think I'm hitting a hard wall on time. So yeah, thank you.